Great. Well, it's a privilege to be here on Zoom with my friend Dave Holden and uh, welcome church. I just really wanted to give you an opportunity to hear a little bit more about who we are as a family of churches. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Dave is a the leader of our family churches, New Ground. And so Dave's kindly agreed just to give us a bit of time just to share some updates and just share his heart on a few things. So Dave, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Oh. There's a, a number of uh, people that have connected with us recently as Welcome Church Berlin. And so can you just give a, a brief kind of history of even who we are as New Ground, part of New Frontiers? Yeah, sure. Um, as you can imagine, there's a long answer to that question and there's a short one. So I'll try and do the, 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 the short one. I, I think um, uh, there was a time um, across Europe, for example, uh, about 40 years ago, where a generation of Christians were emerging um, in very much denominational settings. I come from a conservative evangelical background um, and there was a longing and a desire for more in our Christian lives and reading the New Testament a desire to see church as we saw it back in in the days of the of the, of the early church which all culminated into a hunger and a thirst for more of God which which kind of culminated into what was missing was a rediscovery of the person of the Holy Spirit so people were being filled with the Holy Spirit people were moving against the Holy Spirit for the first time and New Frontiers uh, was kind of born out of that experience as churches found one another and joined together um, with a common desire to make a difference in the nations that, that we were working into. And so the history of New Frontiers fr from there on is basically churches that are founded on certain principles and values which we believe are very strongly in the Bible. So for example, the grace of God um, as a foundation in our lives individually and corporately um, so that it, it's you know I come from a very legalistic Christian background so for me it was a revolution to realize that I don't have to prove anything or be someone in order to earn God's favor but that he'd already loved me and saved me as I am and continues to love and save me even now when I mess up um, and a ch church built on 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 grace and not on judgment and, and competition etc um word and spirit not a big issue for us just churches that passionately love the word of god um, and it's the authority for everything we do and we believe we're obviously living in a time of massive cultural change uh pete you used to be kind of cool and trendy when it came to culture <laughs> you're out of date already five yeah. years behind you you won't even understand the language that they use so um, I, I think being rooted in an unchanging word in an ever-changing culture has been vital. And then Holy Spirit. So word and spirit together. Everything we believe about the spirit comes from the word. Um, and when we look at the word of God, it's through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So those two things go together. I think also being very relationally. We wanted New Frontiers wanted to build churches and plant churches that were relationally built. So like families, you don't see organization in the Bible and CEO leaders. You see families led by fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters all together. That's the language of the New Testament. And I remember a time thinking that the language of the New Testament was a bit kind of soppy and a bit weak um, until I realized that when poor, people like Paul expressed, you know, I yearn for you with all the affection and I pray for you night and day and Timothy, my son in the Lord, all this vocabulary really, really important. So yeah, we're building churches that are grace-filled, build on the word and spirit, and then very much relational. And then maybe the other thing is mission, just re rediscovering that the whole purpose for renewing the church is not for the church's sake, but to equip us so that we can go and make a difference. And so therefore we plant churches uh, that are similar. They're different because they're in different places, languages, cultures, and they have to work it out, but the values don't change. And then New Frontiers grew massively, um, had terrific success, I guess. We had our ups and downs, we weren't perfect, we made big mistakes, um, but got to a place where those values I've just mentioned were beginning to creep around the edges <laughs> because basically it became too big and it was a bit institutional. So 12 years ago, we decided to multiply from one team 
led by one leader called Terry Virgo into multiple teams mm -hmm. um, that we recognized at that time. And those teams grew and flourished and got their own identity. So New Ground became one of those, I think it's about 22 now throughout wow. the world. And we're now involved with over well over 2,000 churches in 80 nations. So it's been quite a journey in 40 years. Um, and I would say at the moment, because of COVID, um, those multiplied teams have come back together again in closer harmony and relationship, just simply because we wanted to really help one another get through this very, very difficult time that we've all been through and bring genuine accountability and all those things I've just mentioned, relationships, et cetera, they're still all well and truly alive amongst us as a family of churches. That was a short answer, Pete. That's great. That's really helpful. That's great. And Dave, you're obviously super involved with New Ground and the core team, but also very involved with the wider New Frontiers world. Um, what, what are some of the things that God's been doing in this last season um, over these last few years within New Ground and New Frontiers. Yeah. It'd be great just to share some updates, I suppose, for, yeah. for those of us that haven't had the opportunity because of the pandemic or because of travel or because we're new to really connect in with, with the wider family. Yeah. Well, it, it's just to say, echo what you said. It, it, it's interesting how it is very global. So Liz and I have just come back from a 17-day trip to South Africa and Zimbabwe and what was fascinating because a very different world to the world I live in here in the UK and how similar it was amazing how you know talking was not a problem even if you had translation to another African dialect or language it, it, it was it was everyone identified with it and I mean I think there's a load of things going on but I mean my 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 headlines because that's what I think should should be in this conversation would be to deeply believe that COVID is not an inconvenient interruption. And if only we could just get over this and survive it. You hear that language, don't you? We just got to get over it. And I think we'll miss it a mile if that's, if that's how, how we think. So I think across New, new Ground and, and New Frontiers broadly, I think there is a now an, an agreement that, you know, COVID wasn't sent by God, but God uses global things to shape us and mold us and teach us things. So realizing it's not an inconvenient interruption, but actually might even be essential that we as a church go through a time like this, because what it does is it, it strips you back. Uh, it makes you really think, what do I really believe about God and his church and his purposes? I, I think it's, it's, it's made us more dependent upon God potentially than we were. I think that it's made us reflect on what are the most important things in life personally? And was there a whole load of things that we used to give a lot of time and energy to that just not important? You know, when a crisis happens, that's what it does. It makes you think, so what's really important? And that's really true corporately. I think a lot of churches reflect now and think, do you know what? We gave hours and hours to things organizationally and we're not even sure that we even think that was very important <laughs> at the end of the day. Now, you're in a church plant, so you will have a different kind of experience. But the principles can still be the same. You know, you can, you can spend all your energy making a good meeting on a Sunday to entertain the crowd of people that come. Or in your case, a lesser of a crowd. But same principle. Um, only to find people are pretty disengaged and just want an hour and a half on a Sunday and then nothing else please for the rest of the week i think it's made lots of churches think very deeply about what are we building i spoke to one pastor he's not in new frontiers but he's a friend of mine big church in the midlands uh, here in the uk and three this is literally what happened three months before the pandemic so we'd never heard of a pandemic never happened he was chatting to me and he said you know i really am worried i thought i said why are you worried you're built you're just doing great you're over a thousand people every sunday and he said, I just think I'm drawing a crowd and I'm not making disciples. And then he said, and I really don't know what to do. I'm stuck. And I'm worried because this crowd looks impressive, but I'm not able to make disciples. Hearing a sermon and going home, I have no idea whether they're really working it out. Yeah. I spoke to him three months after the pandemic happened. He said, Dave, 
the Lord's really answered my prayers. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the crowd have all disappeared. I mean, they've just all gone. And I'm just left with the disciples. And literally, he's now rebuilt his church, all on communities and small groups. And they, they love Sundays. Sundays are still important. I mean, they really are important. They're unique. But they can't be the only thing. And I think the emphasis of disciple making happens in life seven days a week, not in a meeting on a Sunday. There's been loads of discussions about that. And the, and, and the temptation is, if you've learned lessons through COVID like that, then be courageous and you come out because the temptation is go back to the crowd. And we've got to be really intentional making sure that that doesn't happen. I think, you know, I could tell you lots more stories like that. I think that there is a potential health that's coming to the church to equip us to be more able to reach the needs of our generation than we were before. I, I've even wondered if God has used COVID for the church to uh, say to us, you weren't, you weren't fit for what is coming. And what's coming is a harvest of multitudes of people who don't know Jesus, but they come with a lot of baggage. And I think that if we... Um, if we can learn some of these uh, important lessons and get prepared through COVID um, and restored and renewed, then we get ourselves ready for this generation coming, which leads to maybe another lesson for me, which is passionate for me, which is about the Holy Spirit. And I, I just feel that before COVID, this was my experience anyway, it felt like a generation who'd known the things of the Spirit had kind of taken that for granted. And it was kind of tailing off a little bit. Um, less sense of the presence of God, less sense of the gifts of the spirit, the dynamic, the prophetic, um, just pressing into, yeah, the, the, the spontaneous, spontaneous nature of what, what can the spirit do today? You know, that sort of thing. I was turning up into meetings, traveling around, which were good meetings. There was nothing wrong with them. But just a total lack of expectation of something today, Lord, something new. And I think there's, there's a new generation, a post-COVID generation. It's not just an age thing. It's all of us who are still around that got through this. But we desperately need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And to think that in Europe we can do what God's called us to do without the Holy Spirit is just mm. crazy. It's just not going to happen. So I'm... I'm everywhere I go at the moment, I'm just saying to, to leaders, to pastors, make space, make room more than ever for the Holy Spirit. If you can't do it on Sundays, find other times to do it. And of course, you can't make the Holy Spirit do anything. That would be crazy and, and would be false. But you can provide room for him to move if he wants. So if you don't provide the room, you're not going to give him the opportunity. So I think Lots of churches across new ground have been having extra meetings, just waiting God, sometimes with kids, sometimes with youth, students, sometimes the whole church. And I don't think we're, I don't think we're there. I think we need sort of months and maybe, I don't know, even longer, where we get renewed and built up in the spirit. So we've got resources to give to the, the marginalized, the people who are going to come pouring into the kingdom of God. So that's a mixed bag, but it's something yeah, of the sort of great. thing that we're learning. Yeah. The, the, the take home thing is the worst thing of all is to get through all of this and then not really understand why. I mean, that mm. would that'd be so sad. Mm. Um, and we're still rediscovering what those mm. things are. We're on a journey. Mm. Yeah, crucial. Yeah, I know for us starting out, you know, it's maybe been a, a slightly slower start than we had first anticipated but it's been really fruitful just integrating into culture establishing some things building relationships and i think the the two lessons and observations you've taught through there about the, the importance of making disciples and needing the power of the spirit we've we've just been really recognizing that so yeah really helpful what, what about kind of maybe looking forwards like maybe this is more of a new ground thing than new frontiers but that the wider family still connects in. What, what do you see the future of, of new ground and, and moving forwards for us? Yeah, well, um, about 10 days ago, I was the new ground core team got together 
in person for two days for the first time in three years. So we're all just kind of emerging from this kind of thing. And I said to the guys, let's not get into loads of details. Let's have two days of standing back to answer the question that you've just put to me. Like, what is God saying to us? What are we learning? What's the future all about? Um, and, and, be, and for us to be courageous and not just carry on as we were before this happened. I mean, I think we had a lot of momentum before um, the COVID and it's, it's, it's unwise to think we can just pick up that momentum now. We've got to realize momentum's been lost. That's the honest truth. Uh, things that are being paused, things that we were beginning to kind of move forward. Um, you know, we did this thing called Ashburnham. Some of your guys would have been at that. And it's, um, it had massive momentum, so we outgrew it. This was a, a Bible week weekend. So we've got two and a half thousand people gathered from the nations. I thought, great, well, we'll, we'll go and book a bigger uh, thing, which we did. We went to where we have New Day, which is the New Frontiers Young People's event. So big place, you know. And then we realized the reason we did that was because of the momentum, and momentum's now gone. So we can't just go back. So we canceled, we've actually canceled it because we realize we don't have that momentum. So the first thing we've got to do is say, God, please would you gently restore that momentum again in reality? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, I think from September this year, actually onwards, I think there's going to be a slow recovery of all of those things to move us forward. So that will be the first thing to, to, to get back into that momentum of what God has been saying to us. I think the second thing which will thrill you is church planting. And I think that for us, the future is to plant many, many churches. And um, so I think uh, the next two or three years, we're going to absolutely prioritize on this and give ourselves uh, our training, our attention, the raising up of leaders, the, uh, the profiling of church planting. Um, I think since New Ground started, that's not being straightforward. I think it's been quite difficult to mobilize people into church plants, but I really believe that a generation coming out of this are gonna be more open. And just funnily, Liz and I have just had weird, last month, we've just had several conversations with young couples, maybe, maybe late 20s, early 30s, that have come to see us who feel God's called them to church plant. And it's often into different nations not not here where we're based in the uk and i saw that as a little bit of a sign that something's going to emerge it's going to produce so the new ground fundamentally will become a church planting movement and we're now starting to look at all different ways that we can we can do that and that is helping people to get into existing church plants but even kicking off with uh brand new church plants in different places i think another thing for new ground is being intergenerational so I'm in my last decade, probably, of fruitful ministry. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but realistically, you know, you come to that place where you realize I'm, I'm there, that stage of life. Um, been in full-time ministry for over 45 years. That's quite a long journey. And I think for me, the next five years is just spending all my time with a new generation. So most fruitful thing that I am my quarter because we're all a bit older, is to engage with the, the next generation coming through. So for New Ground, it is being creative and finding ways more and more that the older generation and the new generation work together and values and principles and relationships and prophetic promises down through the years, even our corporate history, like we're talking now, gets imparted to people. Uh, in another generation so they said well I wasn't there in the early days but I really really feel that I'm caught up in this thing going forward so so th those are some examples and I think maybe one final thing is that I don't know if this is going to bless you or not <laughs> but I'll say it we believe we believe that Europe is absolutely our number one priority so there's the good news has God forgotten Europe no he hasn't so I would imagine for New Ground, our priority is working into and planting churches across Europe. Mm -hmm. But we did feel even last week when God spoke to us about being global and that wherever God calls us, 
uh, we should be open and not restricted to what that means. So I would imagine that, that new ground and all the other new frontier spheres actually will be continuing to become kind of global movements. So we've just got this growing world, which we call the Portuguese speaking world, uh, which is right on our doorstep. And uh, a number of the pastors from Brazil and Portugal are coming to our leadership conference in November. And uh, I'm going for the first time to Brazil in, in November as well. So there's a door opening there with wonderful people we've been working with for three or four years under the radar, but I think we're now ready to say, come on, let's, uh, let's make a difference into the Portuguese speaking world. Just watching God really opening doors and, and, mm. and rather than saying, mm, don't know, Brazil feels a long way away. Stop thinking like that and realize God is putting together an international family of churches that can all bless and help one another. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't know whether folk in, in Welcome Church will feel like this, but I'm going to just say this is what I feel and hope it connects. I feel torn. I feel on the one hand tired and weary and, you know, not, not, you know, moving on all cylinders. If I've got four cylinders, maybe three, you know, I'm moving on. I, I just feel that in my life. And I think I'm not the only one. I think a lot of people kind of feel still a bit battered and bruised. But at the same time, this is where it's a, you're a bit torn, a very, a, a very exciting sense of the new thing that God's doing. And I think that will eventually become the dominant feature and, and the slight weariness, you know, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. So the more we come to him, the more that weariness, which we shouldn't despise because, you know, they were weary saints all the way through the Old and New Testament. It's a part of life, um, but not letting that shape us, but rather the future shapes us and what God's mm. calling us to do. And, and the gospel constantly, I was in a meeting yesterday where there was a prophetic word about don't lose confidence in the power of the gospel mm. transform people's lives. And it just hit me because I thought, I think I have lost some of that. Mm. And I passionately believe in the gospel. Mm. You know, it's good, the good news to all who believe. But I kind of lost a bit of confidence in its, in its power. <laughs> and I think, I think I, I, I repented and I said, Lord, I want to believe with all my heart. This is the message that will transform everybody. And uh, there was in this meeting of when we were praying, prophesying, a couple who years ago got saved um, in London, completely unchurched backgrounds. She was from a care home. She was abused by a stepfather. He came from a criminal, drunken kind of background. And this couple are now leading a network of churches in the UK and they're really close friends of mine. And I was just, I was just, while this prophetic, I was looking at them and I'm thinking, I remember when you guys got saved and it restored, you know, just looking at them, I thought you can do it again, Lord. Totally non-churched, right? And for you guys in Berlin, with your large percentage of unchurched people, just to walk around Berlin knowing I've got this message within me that has the power to transform even the most hardened non-church person it's just liberating to be reminded of what the gospel can do mm. wow oh dave it's really exciting I can at moments i'm chuckling there because i can relate personally to, to what you're sharing but also just get excited about what what you're saying as well that that need for god's power and strength and yet also that excitement and faith and belief for, yeah. for what we want God to do and mm. yeah I mean we you know it wasn't that many years ago <laughs> where when Sarah and I sat down with you and Liz and thinking about numbers of younger couples now coming to you and getting excited for church planting uh, it does it does fill me with faith and excitement and um, we, with what God's doing apostolically across the nations and being part of this family but also for us here in Berlin you know we we just had this huge city in front of us with 4 million people and just so geographically big. And yet I already believe God wants to start multiple churches across yeah. this city in order to reach it and share that good news of the gospel. And, and yet also, you know, we I remember you talking with me in the early days saying, encouraging me to, to start with Berlin. And that's definitely the focus. 
the reality is we, we're probably the furthest east new ground church when it comes to Europe and yeah. you know the nations are just are just flooded uh, in, in Berlin and on our doorstep and you know we're not far from Poland and mm-hmm. and uh, just the rest of Eastern Europe and so many Middle Eastern people that, that live in the city and just opportunities you know whether it's within the city but also to then send people to the nations as well it's, it's exciting how, how privileged you guys are to be in an environment like that because you're true it's true and the nations of the world are coming I did a an international celebration in a church in Hillingdon in London and it's the most diverse borough in the whole of London they've they, in this church got 53 nations in it and it was a celebration of all the internationals they all came in their costumes all, all except the people like me because we don't have a costume <laughs> and uh, everyone was bedecked it was the most outstanding thing um, and I talked on let the nations be glad and and at the end my final point this is why it's relevant for Berlin I said to all the people that are there you know at the end of the day you've all come from nations where God is doing amazing things and you've all landed in a nation where 90 percent of the people don't know Jesus and they've got no, no desire to go to church. Therefore, God's brought you here to reach not only all your nations, but this nation too. Mm. And I think when you're living in a place like Berlin, with all its multitude of languages and nations and nationalities, um, you, you just realise that opportunity is twofold. One, it is to reach all of those nations. But two, it is to reach your, your average Berliner who's mm. actually lived there and families have lived there for generations. And I just think it's that, 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 that double thing of mm. being part of the, the culture of Berlin, so you understand it and you can relate to it, but also this prophetic picture of the nations of the world, because out from even your church, there will be these plants and things that happen. You know, we've had a lot to do with the Ukrainian situation. Newground has, has done great. We've been very generous financially. We've sent busloads of stuff to the Polish border and loads of others. I mean, New Frontiers, you know, whatever. Well, I don't know what it is in euros, but, you know, about one million four hundred thousand pounds across the world to help Ukraine. But part of it is is them and they're planting churches with refugees all over Europe I mean it's staggering to watch it happen and again out of this terrible tragedy and it's an awful tragedy seeing well God where are you working what is what are you doing through this most of them all want to go back to Ukraine in the end because that's their passion but in the moment you know if you've got loads of Ukrainians in Italy then get in there and plant a church it's it's, it's just fascinating to watch it happen mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, the whole world is in a is in a state of flux and turmoil, and uh, but Jesus is building His church right in the middle of it all in ways that you and I would never ever have dreamt of. Mm. That's really exciting. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dave, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get a few of us out to the leadership conference in November, and I'm I'm talking some of you guys into coming here, and for those that aren't able to travel. Into, into the UK and other places to, to be able to share a lot of what God's doing and, and impart these great um, gifts to us. And so thank you for your time. Any any kind of final words for Welcome Church Berlin, this great yeah. church plant, people that are yeah. working yeah. hard? Yeah, you're, you, I, I know you think I'm just going to say this, but it's absolutely true. You are not forgotten. <laughs> and we pray for you ever so much. So in our core team, just, just 10 days ago, we had a solid time praying for people like you guys uh, praying for all the things you know it's not been an easy time every everybody planting churches has had to acknowledge it's been a, a tough time but as you've already said nevertheless things being built in you uh, for the future so I just want to encourage everybody welcome church hang on in there let faith levels rise rather than diminish be patient uh, in this delay of expansion God's putting things into you, training you, um, it, 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 it's going to be, we're going to see massive breakthroughs. Suddenly, God will do things which we thought would take years and we will rejoice because we know it's not us. It's God who did it. So, yeah. Mm. Great.
Thank you very much. Pleasure. Great. Cool. There you go, guys. Dave Holden, New Ground, exciting stuff. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cheers. <laughs>